Well, welcome to our 945 service. It's good to see you. How, how many of you are, you are reminded that an hour makes a big difference? How many of you with young kids are like, this is gonna affect us for two weeks. Thank you very much. Time change, yeah, wonderful. Um, it is so good to be back with you uh, teaching this weekend and uh, I'm so thankful uh, to Pastor Dennis and Pastor Josh for the last two weeks as they've sort of begun our study of this high priestly prayer uh, in John 17 and I get the honor of um, ending it with you today and I'm really excited for that. So uh, my name's Ryan, I'm one of the pastors here. If you're over in the chapel or online, a special welcome to you also. You're probably aware of this from like a humanities class in either high school or college that uh, most cultures around the world and throughout time have had creation myths or creation narratives, like ways that they explain how we got here. But in explaining how we got here, also trying to unpack why we are here. I mean, one of the most famous of the ancient creation myths is called the Enuma Elish, and it's uh, the Babylonian creation myth. And listen to a summary of what that myth tells people about why we're here. The narrative unfolds as the chief deity of the Babylonians, his name is Marduk, defeats the chaotic goddess Tiamat and all of, and all of her allies. Now, Marduk establishes order in the universe, creates the heavens and the earth, and then out of Tiamat's blood forms human beings and forms them for the explicit purpose that they would serve the gods, right? And that's the way that so many of these ancient myths, creation myths go, that human beings are created ultimately to serve the gods. In fact, um, scholar Richard Middleton studied the five most famous creation myths, not, not, not the one you find in the scriptures, but the other most, five most famous creation myths. And here's how he summarized them. He said, the fundamental human destiny and duty is to care for the needs of the gods, which is understood as the provision of food and housing for them. Now, that's his summary of the five most popular non-biblical stories about why we're here. And I think on, on one level, that makes some sense. Like if, if there is a creator and we are the created, then we should serve the gods, quote unquote. But on a whole nother level, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? That a God would need us to provide food and shelter for them? Like what kind of God are you if you're waiting on Paulson to provide you a steak in order to have enough to eat? Like, I would say that this view of not only creation, but of the gods falls way short of anything that we might deem as being accurate. As you might guess, the biblical story of why we're here and how we got here is far different. There's this great book I read a few months ago entitled Beholding by um, a New Zealand author named Strahan Coleman. And in it, I think he captured the biblical story of how we got here and why we're here so beautifully. So here's what I wanna invite you to do. It's a bit of a lengthy text. So I want you to close your eyes and I want you to just sort of enter in to the creation story as it's artistically told from this viewpoint of scripture. Listen to what he wrote. He said, in the beginning, there was only silence and void and God created like Bach, Mozart or Beethoven. He weaves threads of life and gra gravity and suspense of spring and autumn with a profound pleasure and promise. Explosions of life spring into the vacuum of space, twisted rock and gas. Galaxies of dust and debris form a cosmos stretching so far that it bends the tracks of time itself. And there amidst everything, a marble of green and blue is suspended, sea and land separated with a clap of God's hands, earth and sky pull apart with his joy-filled laughter, life pops up in all of its forms. But it isn't enough. God has something else in mind, a deeper, more fulfilling relationship that cannot yet be found in any other thing he's made. His love wants to be shared. 
He wants to create something that can return to him the vivacious joy that he feels and can commune free of all the kinds of instincts and laws the rest of creation is bound by. So God kneels down on the musty soil of planet Earth and begins to gather into clumps. Tears of joy and love roll from his eyes, softening the dirt, giving him workable substance to bring into form a wonder yet unseen in the cosmos until then. Hands, feet, a head to carry the mind, a heart to inhabit the chest, legs, fingers, eyebrows, organs. God makes his human. Catch this, you guys. Next, so he can guarantee the image of this new creation that it will reflect his own image. He does something exceptional. He leans over, kneels beside the form, laying out his legs and knees over ours, his chest against our chest, his arms stretched out against our arms, his face finally pressed up against ours. Then from this abundant longing, he takes a deep breath, and excitedly breathes his breath into our lungs. Our lungs expand. We take our first breath out of complete darkness. We awaken to life as a cosmic infant, not knowing yet how to open our eyes. Slowly, we draw upon the muscles above our eyebrows, prying our eyelids open. And in this sacred moment, the first impression of what life in the world will be, the very first thing we see is not the soil, It's not the vast emptiness. It's not even the beauty of the garden. The very first thing we see is the face of God. Eye to eye, mouth to mouth, chest to chest. I'm I'm not sure how that lands on you. But every time I read that, I just, I get chills. It's so different than than the gods creating out of of the blood of a slain deity in order to be served, in order that that he he or she might get something from us. No, no, our, our story is that God creates out of an overflow of love. Our story is that God creates in order to invite us into love and into life, love displayed, love to be shared, tender, personal care. And it stands in stark contrast to every other creation story that's out there. See, from the very beginning, the story in our scriptures is not about what God can get from you. From the very beginning, the story is about what God wants for you. And that's what it's about from beginning to end. He creates out of an overflow of love so that we would know him and so that we would be with him. And that subtle shift of from to for has the ability to change everything. See, as a a parent, there are things that I want from my kids, right? I mean, I want them to treat people with respect. I I want them to work hard. I want them to study hard. I want them to clean up after themselves. Please, Jesus, right? (laughs) But everything I want from my kids is ultimately based on what I want for my kids. I mean, I want them to live a joy-filled life. I want them to flourish. I mean, my wife Kelly and I, we didn't have kids in order so that we could get some help around this place. Like, like, that wasn't the plan. Like, we need somebody to do the dishes. You know what we should do? Children. (laughs) Spoiler alert. They don't do the dishes. Right? No. Like, that's not why we had kids. We had kids out of an overflow of the love that we have for one another and a desire to invite others into that love. We want something for them, not something from them. So when Jesus was talking to his disciples about the way that God feels about them, listen to what he said. He said, if you then who are evil, and let's all try not to take offense at that, okay? Know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, everybody say how much more? How How much more will your father who's perfect and owns a cattle on a thousand hills and is absolutely passionate 
about you and in love with you, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Man, so here's what Jesus is saying. Like, you love your kids and you're, let's, let's just call it imperfect. <laughs> how much more does God love you and want to give you good? See, here's the thing. From beginning to end, the story is ultimately about not the question, what does God want from me? The ultimate question, the bigger question, the more important question is what does God want for me? In fact, I'd invite you to write this down today. What God wants for me is more important than what God wants from me. What God wants for me is more important than what God wants from me. And I think that little turn has the ability to loose the weight that so many people walk into these doors with. Because religion over and over will say, this is what you need to do to get to God. This is what you need to do to get God on your side. These are the hoops that you need to jump through. These are the things that you need to check off your list. And if you do those, then God is pleased with you. The story that we find ourselves in is that God is passionately in love with us, even if and when we reject him, that he ultimately wants good for us. He needs nothing from us. He's completely free and independent of himself. Therefore, he is free to love you even at your worst. That's the story we are. And there may be no better place in all the scriptures that that truth comes onto the pages and into our hearts and lives than in this prayer that we find in John chapter 17. So if you have your Bible, please open there with me. We get the chance to eavesdrop on Jesus talking to his father. And I'm just struck by this, you guys. I'm struck by the fact that in all that's facing Jesus, I mean, betrayal and the cross and everything that's coming, Jesus' prayer here is not, like, Father, can, like, can you give me some better disciples that won't desert me? Like, Lord, can you help them at least just stay awake? Lord, can you just vindicate me, eliminate my enemies? Like, I, I wouldn't fault Jesus for praying any of that. But that isn't what this prayer is about. This prayer is not self-seeking, even though I wouldn't fault him. This prayer from beginning to end is completely others focused. It's Jesus praying first, Father, glorify your name. And then it's Jesus praying, Father, pr um, protect and, and empower and work through these disciples, these 11 guys who are right around me right then. And then today, it's gonna be Jesus praying for you and me. And as we listen in, as we lean in and gaze in, we are leaning into the center of the cosmos into the breathtaking conversation of the triune God that is to say today, we get to hear what love sounds like. So John chapter 17, starting in verse 20. Are you there? Three of you? Fine, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Jesus says this, I do not ask for these, these 11 only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Psst. This is Jesus praying for us. Like, we are the ones who have believed in him through their word. His faithful followers who recorded, carried along by the spirit, recorded the words of Jesus, recorded teachings that they wanted passed down to the churches that's been passed down to us over the course of a few thousand years by faithful people who have carried that flame of faith and passed it down from one generation to the next. We are sitting here because the answer to Jesus's prayer was yes. And every time you mentor someone, every time you teach a Sunday school class or serve in our junior high or high school or young adult ministry, every time you take time to invest in somebody who's coming behind you, you are being an answer to Jesus's prayer. And I love the way that this church does that in such a beautiful manner. See, because God always expands his message and his kingdom through his people. And now Jesus is going to get into the content of his prayer. And at the very first thing that he's going to say, I, I want us to um, wrestle with four questions about what Jesus says first. Here's the first question. What does Jesus want for us? 
What does he expect we will get? Or how does he expect we will get it? How will we maintain it? And why does he want it for us? Wow, Ryan, those are really good questions. Let's dive into that. Okay. Verse 21. What does Jesus want for us? That they may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So what does Jesus want for us? He wants us to be unified. He doesn't want us to be divided. He doesn't want us to all be pulling in our each own separate direction built on our preferences and our desires and our vision. He wants us to be united. Second, how do we get there? Like, how does that take place? Well, Jesus tells us. He said that they may also be in us. So how does the unity that Jesus envisions take place in his church? Like, here's a spoiler alert, you guys. It's not because we all agree on everything. It's not because we have every single, like, theological nuance ironed out. It's not because we all like have ironed out our eschatology or a view of women in leadership or any other debatable topic and we go, we all agree on this. No, we are unified, not because we all agree on every little nuance, but because we are all convinced that by faith, we are in Christ. That's what brings us together. Now, maybe a picture might be helpful. Um, back in John chapter 14, Jesus told us, that he was going to send his Holy Spirit, clearly the Holy Spirit, <laughs> to dwell in you, okay? And he not only said that, it's better than that, he said that his Spirit would dwell in you forever, right? And here he builds on that. He says, not only does the Spirit of God live in you, but when you put your faith in Jesus, you are invited into the life of the triune God himself. So the spirit is in you, and then you are in God who is in Christ, and they are mutually in one another. This is like beautiful dance going on. And Jesus would say, this is the picture of why we are unified of how we're brought together. Um, it was, I, I couldn't find like two billion little boxes to put inside of this. So you're just gonna have to envision it that way. Like it's not just you as an individual in Christ, it's us together who we are, the spirit living in us and we are in God. That's the picture that Jesus paints. That's why we are and can be unified. And Jesus's vision for his people is that, man, that they would be formed in that community. That's what he wants for us. He wants that to be like the organizing principle of our life. Like the thing that's most important to us. We are in Christ. You are included in the life of the triune God. See, community can sort of be a catchphrase. Like some churches will be like, we have great community here. Some people might be like, well, I wish we had deeper community. And oftentimes like our community is found around like finding our people. And what we mean by that is like people who are on the same phase of the journey or maybe have kids like we have or don't have kids like we don't have or we're like-minded or we're compatible. And can you see how all of those things fall hopelessly short of the vision that Jesus gives for how we be unified? Like we're in Christ, involved and included in the life of the triune God. I mean, think about the first followers that Jesus had around him. I mean, one of them was called a zealot. That meant he carried a little dagger on his leg and was willing to fight anybody that came against the nation of Israel. And he also had a tax collector, which means he had sold out his people and was coercing them and manipulating them in order to steal money from them. And Jesus said, hey, why don't we all gather around the same table? You're, all, you're, you're gonna be my disciples. And what's gonna bind you together is the fact that you are in me. 
because it's more powerful than anything that could tear you apart. The fact that we are in Christ is more powerful than our preferences in worship, our nuances and our theological conviction, our compatibility or shared interests, our commonplace in life. There's something bigger. We are in him. And so, third question, how is that unity maintained? Listen to what Jesus said, and this might shock you if you actually hear it. The glory that you have given me, I have, say it with me, church, given to them that they may be one even as we are one. Now, I don't think there'd be any debate among us. There might be, but I I doubt it, that God is glorious. That word means weighty or majestic or beautiful, powerful, like the attributes of God on display. I think we would all go, God is glorious. Yes and amen. But that's not what this passage says. This passage says that the glory that the father gave to his son, his son now gives to his church. Did you, but would you just turn to the person next to you and say, you're looking glorious today. You're looking glory, you're looking, you're looking glorious today. But it's not just to individuals. Maybe it'd be better from my perspective to say, y'all are looking glorious today. Because it's not, you're welcome. Because it's not just, thank you. But it's not just us as individuals, it's us as a community. There's something about the way that he moves among us that allows us to embody his beauty and his majesty. See, see, seeing Jesus' majesty, Jesus would say, frees you to walk in unity. But how? How? I think if we go back to the very beginning of the story of the church, it's, it's, birth, it's birthday on Pentecost. And listen to Peter preaching. I think we're going to get an insight into what this glory looks like. Listen to what Peter said. He said, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter said to the rest of the apostle, Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. So what makes Jesus beautiful? Well, the fact that we gather here together under this banner of we can't make it on our own. We need forgiveness. And by his life, death, and resurrection, he has provided forgiveness. He has freed us. He's given us his spirit. And we gather together under the confession that Jesus is Lord. This is the centering proclamation of the church. It has been from the very beginning. The same thing that gets us in is the same thing that holds us together. And it's the thing that makes us beautiful. It's not the anthem, we've got it all together. It's the anthem, he holds it all together. And he is good and he is gracious and we need him and he has provided for us. That's what makes us glorious. Now, Why? Why does Jesus envision a church that's glorious, that's unified? Ah, so glad you asked. I and them, you and me. That they might become perfectly one so that the world, what? May know that you've sent me and loved me even as or then loved them even as you loved me. I think I read this passage wrong for almost my whole entire Christian life. Because I always read this passage that, man, as Jesus binds us together, like our voice is gonna be louder. And then people are gonna, people are gonna hear, they're gonna respond. There's gonna be like such a, like this movement of people who are unified, growing, growing, growing. And there's gonna be a power in our united proclamation. That isn't what Jesus says here. What Jesus says is that they will know that you sent me and have what? 
love them. See, see, I think the evangelistic echo of the church is not just the objective nature of the gospel. It's the subjective nature of the love that we live in and the freedom that we experience because of that love. I think what Jesus envisions is a church so confident, so safe, so centered in his love that it becomes so beautiful that people on the outside look in and go, how do I get in on that? How does does that kind of confidence, that kind of grounding, that kind of anchor become a part of my life? I think they know, quote unquote, they know because they recognize that people are free and healed in the love of God. Um, a, a good friend of mine pointed me towards uh, just an excellent TED Talk a little while back. It was a TED Talk uh, about um, a, a doctor named uh, Dr. Bruce Alexander. And he did a series of studies that eventually were entitled and named Rat Park. But before he ever did those studies, decades earlier, there was a series of studies that people had drawn conclusions off of. And the study was this. They put a rat in a cage and they put water in one water bottle that was pure water. And then right next to it in the same cage was drug-laced, cocaine and heroin-laced water. Okay? And what they found was that the rat would go up to the drug-laced water over and over and over again, eventually overdosing and killing himself. So for a number of years, that study was just out there and it sat there and we assumed, well, that that's the way that drugs work. Like you're just gonna keep going back to it. Until Dr. Bruce Alexander in the 70s introduced another variable, other rats. So they put other rats in the cage with this one rat, same water, pure water, drug-laced water. And here's what they found. As those rats were free to roam and to socialize, and as the study says, to have sex, you know, doing what rats do, okay? As they were free to be who God created them to be in the midst of community, they remarkably preferred the pure water. When inhabiting, this is what he says, when inhabiting Rat Park, they preferred the plain water, and even though they drank from the drug-laced water bottle, they did so intermittently, not obsessively, and never overdosed. The conclusion of the study is that a social community beat the power of drugs. Now, let's just take that out of the realm of like drugs for a moment, and let's just put it in the realm of anything that wars against our soul. Because we all walk in here with attachments that have the ability to destroy us. So let's just, let's just take it out of that and like put it in the place where we can all relate. Like what if that's the kind of community that Jesus envisions? The kind of community that brings about freedom and hope. The kind where our lesser attachments are loosened so that we can rest and trust in the love of God alone as the lover of our souls. I love the way that Pastor Rich Viotas put it. He said this. He said, we are wounded in community and we are healed in community. No way around it. Healing might not come from the community where the wounding took place, but community is needed for healing nonetheless. Man, if I, if I had a stump to get up on, like this would be one of my speeches, you guys. The church is intended to be a hospital. A hospital where healing is found in healthy community. The church is not designed for people who have it all together. In fact, it was Jesus himself who said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. So if we know that, then we won't expect each other to be perfect. Can I get an amen? We might expect to find here what we find in the churches that are mentioned throughout the New Testament, churches that were messy, churches regardless of how broken your life is, you would feel right at home. See, the church is to be the place where we learn to forgive each other, where we help each other carry our burdens, where we find real help for the things assaulting our soul. And when the church doesn't live up to that vision, It is so painful because that's exactly why Jesus put us here. A hospital to be healed and to become whole, not a museum of our own faithfulness, an Ebenezer to God's grace and his love. The church must become a place 
where God's love is so manifest, his grace is so on display, his power so embodied that people would find the freedom their souls were created for and the watching world would look in and go, where do I get some of that? Where do I get some of that? That's Jesus's vision. That's the heart of his prayer. And the truth is, you guys, that, that can start in a room like this, but it can't end in a room like this. Like that can't be the telos of the vision is like we got together on Sunday. Like that kind of freedom takes place in living rooms and life groups and support groups and recovery groups and set free and freedom in Christ. Those, I think, would be the places where the world would so easily and readily be able to look on and go, That's what I was created for. So that's the first thing that Jesus says. Now, if you're wondering, Ryan, how long is this sermon going to be? Um, the next two things Jesus wants for you are not as long in the text, okay? And they won't be as long for me either. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am to, say it with me, see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. See, there's a glory that Jesus gives to his church. And then there's a future glory that he will show us one day when we see him face to face. I love this because when you, when you start to get to know somebody's deepest desires, I think you really get to know them. So what, what's one of Jesus's deepest desires? One of his deepest desires is that you would see his glory. Like that you'd see him as he actually is. Like the veil pulled back, the the coat of the chest opened up. Now, is that egotistical? Is that self-centered? Is he like, I just want them to see how awesome I am because I'm so awesome? Like maybe that's a part of it, but probably not in that tone. No, I, I, I think, I think that it's in that moment when we see him in all of his glory that our soul will be complete, that we will be filled with the love of God as we look into his eyes and we will see that the object of our faith is worthy of our life. In that moment, we will realize that there is nothing that we have missed out on by following Jesus, but that we have only gained everything, in that moment, we will see that it was completely worth it, regardless of the pain and the sorrow and the road, whatever road you walked, when you see him face to face, you'll go, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. And I think Jesus wants, what does he want for us? He wants us to be confident in destiny, in our destiny. Later on, the the same John who wrote this gospel would write letters to the churches, and in one of those letters, he he says, Man, you guys, see what kind of love the Father's lavished on us. That he calls us his children because we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, he says, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. Isn't that a great sort of paradox, nuance? Like, we are his children now, but one day it will come fully into light and in the open and it'll feel even different than it does now. We know that when he appears, we shall be, what? Like him, because we shall see him as he is. See, let's put this together. Jesus is praying that we would see his glory. That's one of the things he wants for us. And John would later add to that, when we see him or see his glory, we will be transformed to become like him. So catch this, friends. There will be a day when you will stand before the throne of God There will be a day when you will see him face to face and his eyes of love will pierce to the very core of your soul, a soul that is created fearfully and wonderfully. And in that moment, you will be fully known and fully loved. You will be transformed into the quote unquote you that Jesus always designed you to become. And not someone different, not someone different, 
But a vision fulfilled, the real you will emerge as the false self and fig leaves fall to the floor. And in that moment, you will know what it feels like to be absolutely naked and completely unashamed because you will be completed in his grace and safe in his love. That day is coming. That day is coming. So today, with all of your struggles and all of your imperfections, you can rest confidently in your destiny. You are in him, and one day you will become like him, transformed. Okay, one more thing, one more thing. What does Jesus want for us? Here's how he finishes. That's, that's really good. I just need to say, that's, that's good news, is it not? <laughs> Praise God, thank you. O oh, righteous Father, Jesus prays, even though the world doesn't know you, I know you. And these know you have sent me. I made known to them your name. So quick pause. When we talk about knowing his name, or Jesus talks about knowing his name, what he's talking about is knowing like, the essence of his character, like who he is in the most pure manner, where what you believe about God would, be, uh, would just be filtered down and distilled to only what is true. That's what he means by knowing his name. He says, I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known. Like, it's like today, he moves in our midst to make his character and his essence and his nature known. <sighs> that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Okay, okay, this is huge, this is huge. What happens when people understand the name of God? What happens when people understand the character of God, the nature of God, his essence, when it's on display? What is the core characteristics of people who see it? According to Jesus, the love of God makes its home in our hearts. So, so let's say it like this. You know that you know God when you know you're loved by him. Not because you did anything for him, but because you are in him known by him, covered in the avalanche of his grace and his love for you. I absolutely love that Jesus' prayer is I want them to know that they're loved. Like beyond a shadow of a doubt, I just, I, I want them to know it. Like, Father, would you help them know that they are loved, even that the very ground of their being would be love. Because it changes everything. It changes everything. I, I think that's why the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus and prayed. And he said this, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he might grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and what? Grounded in love may have strength to comprehend. Okay, so here's the deal, you guys. You're gonna need strength to get this. Like You can't get this on your own. You can't understand this on your own. Not to the extent that God wants you to get it. So he, he's praying that you'd have strength to comprehend. Well, what in the world does Paul want the church in Ephesus to have strength to comprehend? Let's keep reading. With all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. Praise God. 
we need strength to comprehend this love because being found in that kind of love demands that we drop our defenses and our self-salvation projects. It means that we open ourselves up before God, taking the most fundamental risk of faith, which is to believe that when I am vulnerable, I am still loved by the one who created me and knows my faults, knows my deepest darkness. The risk of faith is to believe that I am loved even on my worst day. And it's that kind of love that when you get it, provides a freedom for your soul that nothing else will. After all, it's where we were born, that very first breath of God. And it's where we are reborn. Not because God wants something from us, but because he wants something for us. And see, I think that knowing Jesus is praying for you will give you the freedom to just drop your defenses and rest in him. A few months ago, I was uh, on a walk with my, one of my friend and mentor, Dennis Keating, and we were just talking about life and um, some, just some hard things that we were both walking through. And after our walk, uh, he texted me this picture that had meant a lot to him. And um, ever since I saw it, I just haven't been able to get it out of my mind. So it depicts Jesus reaching down into the water to get Peter as he's starting to sink in the, in the Sea of Galilee. And even though this passage isn't about that moment exactly, I get the same sense that in this prayer, Jesus is reaching out to you, that he's reaching out to me, that that he's reaching out to people who have been burdened by religion and to-dos and checklists and hoops to jump through, thinking if I can do something for God, then he'll love me. And, And I think Jesus is reaching out and saying, it's not about what you can do for me, it's about what I've already done for you. You might feel like the water's rising in your life. You might feel like you're drowning today. You might feel like you've walked in burdened by all sorts of things. And I think so many people walk in these doors every week like that. But today, you guys, today, you need to know that he prays for you, that you would be healed in community, that you'd be confident in your destiny, not because of your good works or your accomplishments, but because of him and that you would be grounded in his love for you. He prays for you. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He reaches out through the water that you might be drowning in to say, ah, I love you. This has always been about my love from beginning to end. And I think he's reaching out today saying, will you ground your life in that love. That reaching out is not about what God wants from you. It's about what God wants for you. So what do you say back to him? Let me give you a moment. you and God. You might even look up at that picture and I don't know what's going on in your life, but he does. And I wonder what your response is to the Jesus who prays.